welcome to another episode of The Crane, an Africa-China podcast brought to you by the Dongsheng Collective. In this session, we will be joined by a special guest to focus on a specific African country, the DRC, or Democratic Republic of Congo, or perhaps Congo-Kinshasa. And we're really excited to start. This will be our first interview. We're hoping we can have many more sessions where we focus specifically on a individual country and how not only is it doing its own internal development, but how it relates to China and other foreign actors. Um, around the world. So today we'll be focusing on the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a country right at the heart, right at the center of the African continent. It is the 12th biggest country in the world. It's only slightly smaller than one quarter of the US, and it's home to 108 million people who are all coming from many different linguistic, ethnic, and regional backgrounds. It is extremely rich in cobalt, copper, Colton, which we find in our cell phones, you know, petroleum, diamonds, gold, silver, as well as uh, natural resources in terms of timber and um, potential hydropower. It's also home to the Congo Basin, which is the world's second largest rainforest, which is really crucial for regulating the world's climate. You know, this is second to the Amazon that we find in the uh, Brazilian forests in Latin America. But despite the wealth of you know, fertile soil, energy potential, mineral resources, human capacity, the DRC still struggles with many socioeconomic problems, which include, you know, high inf infant mortality rate, um, maternal mortality rate, there's malnutrition, lack of access to vital services such as water and sanitation. Um, and we also have seen various forms of what, you know, in the Western media will just say, you know, violent conflict. Um, that often is decontextualized, of course, but nonetheless has cost many, many millions of lives in the, in the Congolese uh, civil war in previous decades. And so we will be trying to address a lot of the questions that are raised by the fact that we have this extremely rich, really big and really central African nation that is still not able to service its population um, that we're hoping to address today. Indeed. We hope to discuss a couple of questions with our guest today, namely um, what he sees as the key issues and sites of struggle when it comes to the um, DRC-China uh, relationship. Um, how do we characterize the DRC-China relationship and um, what he sees as the future paths towards um, development that is uh, mutually beneficial and rewarding. So to answer these questions, we are joined by our special guest, Kambale Musavuli today. Uh, Kambale is a leading human rights advocate and an analyst for the Center for Research on the Congo Kinshasa. For a decade, he has served as the spokesperson for the Friends of the Congo. Kambale lectures on conflict, minerals, peace and security, advocacy, grassroots mobilization, social movements, the role of youth in Africa, corporate social responsibility, gender-based violence, and its connection to resource exploitation and poverty, a man of many talents. He firmly believes that through Pan-Africanism, based on scientific socialism, Congolese and Africans have a chance to regain control over their land and destiny. Boye malamu, Kambale. Welcome. Boye malamu, Kambale. Is that how you say it in Lingala? It's close. <laughs> it's we close, it's it. close. It's really <laughs> very words. proper, right? <laughs> uh, Boye malamu is very, very proper. So you had to dig that one very deep. <laughs> so that's very good. I'm like, wow. I'm in Kinshasa and speaking uh, Lingala. So it's very beautiful. Fantastic. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Kambale, could you briefly tell us a little bit about your work and what you see as the key issues and areas of struggle uh, in the DRC today when it comes to uh, the DRC's relationship with China? The work that we're doing uh, specifically uh, with the Center for Research on the Congo uh, at the moment has been to collect uh, the stories, stories of Congolese elders uh, who have 
uh, worked in the struggle uh, to liberate the Congo for decades. Uh, we are actually going to be publishing a book of uh, one of them, Dr. Uh, George Bokamba, uh, who uh, in his uh, 50s uh, was being taught by Haitians. Um, and then, of course, in the 60s, there were more Haitians that came into the DRC as part of uh, the bilateral relationship the DRC had with Haiti um, to have people who were francophone uh, in the country that did not have many university graduates right after independence and have them come in the Congo to teach uh, the universities, uh, the schools, and so on. And in the process of collecting these stories, I'm realizing that uh, the fundamental challenge for us from uh, the eldest generation to our generation, and way back, if I have to go all the way when the Portuguese came, is that the Congolese people, or the people who live in the area that we call the Democratic Republic of Congo, have had a huge challenge uh, to determine their own affairs. Uh, that means political representation. Uh, that means also the use of their land and resources for the benefit of the people who are on that land. And I think that's uh, from the angle uh, that we may want to discuss today, uh, in, in the time where uh, the world is discussing Ukraine, uh, the world is discussing uh, Taiwan, uh, in the Congo, we're discussing what is Secretary Blinken doing in the Congo uh, in the height of a conflict, um, of an invasion, right, of an aggression of his neighbor, uh, Rwanda. Uh, why is Secretary Blinken coming here? And surprisingly, uh, the answer to that is Congo's mineral resources. That's why Secretary Blinken is here. Uh, not because I say so, because he himself, shared in uh, meetings with uh, the Prime Minister of the DRC uh, that Congo's resources at this juncture, specifically cobalt, is important for the uh, U.S. and they want to get back into the game of uh, getting access to Congo's resources. But for us, the Congolese, we are fighting. We want to make sure that for the future of the Congo, uh, it's not decided in London, it's not decided in Washington or Paris. That's uh, the current situation uh, that I can present, at least for the work that I'm doing and uh, the current discussion in the streets of Kinshasa today. Thank you. And so we're going to dive into straight into um, the relationship between China and the DRC, especially in more recent years. And there was a recent news article uh, basically coming from the Chinese Foreign Ministry, information about how China, which is Africa's largest bilateral lender, in terms of loans that have been usually used for building infrastructure and various infrastructure for services, transport, education, recreation, uh, will be waiving debt owed by 17 countries in the continent for about 23 interest-free loans that were due last year, 2021. And uh, we're raising this because, you know, DRC is potentially likely to be on that list. It hasn't been confirmed yet. But uh, the DRC has taken about 59 loans of uh, 2.3 billion from China or received them between 2000 and 2020, so the last two decades. Most of it, 1 billion of it, has gone to funding transport infrastructure. And the second amount, I think, has gone to power around uh, 676 million uh, has gone as the second area. And last year, in January 2021, China did cancel some of the DRC's loans uh, when they joined the Belt and Road Initiative. And, you know, for those who don't know, the Belt and Road Initiative is connecting countries not only in Africa to China, but across Asia, what people tend to call the Middle East and parts of Europe. And this connectivity project has shown a lot of promise and a lot of material benefits in terms of digital infrastructure, water infrastructure, trade and transport infrastructure. But of course, the amount of loans that it wrote off was around 23 million, which is, you know, a small fraction of a 2.3 billion worth loans. But so we just wanted to get your take in recent years, the loans that have been agreed upon between the DRC and China, what have you seen as the result of it? Have they been beneficial? Where have they occurred? And how would you characterize them? 
first instinct yeah, the, uh, for the project that the Chinese are doing now is that the project itself is beneficial to the Congolese people. Uh, we need infrastructure uh, in the DRC. We need uh, better roads and new roads. Uh, we need access to electricity. Uh, we need pretty much a lot of new infrastructure, hospitals and so on. So in um, practice, uh, these are great things. Uh, but Congo has a challenge, and the challenge is not necessarily China. We have a comprador issue. We have an elite issue. Um, we have an issue where our politicians, our local politicians, must demonstrate that the people will benefit from that. Um, that's where at least our fight at the, lo- at the local level is, is to make sure that for what China has pledged, that we are holding our leaders accountable to make sure that if um, a hydro dam has, is part of that, is completed, and now we are able to access uh, electricity. I mean, uh, in the news, I think this past month, uh, we saw that a, power, a water plant um, was actually open. Um, this was uh, another support. I, I don't think it came from uh, China, but it was a support from uh, uh, Korea. Uh, to build a water plant. You know, uh, in the area of uh, Kinshasa, we have access to potable water. Uh, there is an hydro dam that's in construction to be completed very soon by China. Um, I went through uh, Gombe. Uh, it's a neighborhood uh, in Kinshasa. And going toward uh, the Congolese parliament, and there is a huge and uh, massive uh, cultural center. It's going to be the biggest cultural center on the African continent, being built by the Chinese. Uh, you can see that uh, it's actually going, at least from what I'm seeing, that they're going to be completing it very soon. Um, those things are important you know, to bring about the Congolese culture, even uh, the fact that uh, Congolese music has just been um, uh, labeled as uh, a world heritage by UNESCO uh, today. Oh, so wow. Congolese culture... Yes, that's a bon <laughs> a, Exactly, right? So... It, the Congolese culture is an important aspect of who we are as Congolese people and having a place where thousands of people can experience it is more. So the way I look at the China deals you know, from the early 2000s to present is more that, that we must watch for the accomplishments of this project from the local elite perspective that they are uh, making sure that the pro- project ends. Um, but then China is not the only actor. They have many projects. Um, you have the Turkish, where well, uh, they are here. The Russians are here. Uh, Japan is here. So many countries are here. Um, my worry around the loans is the level of um, the loans. We, we are now two billion. Our local uh, elites uh, who signed these deals, did they establish a proper program to make sure that we repay the loans as we said we will repay. Now, that's one of the challenges right? that I see uh, coming from these loans. But sure. hearing that China is forgiving uh, $23 million, you can see that it's not as easy as uh, building during the time of COVID and not having the resources to generate to pay your debt, that they are actually, uh, China is being proactive in making sure that those they are supporting are able to repay and also seeing some uh, alleviation uh, for the payment. At least that's how I'm seeing it in how to evaluate China's project in Congo. It's, uh, we have a delete, a comprador issue to deal with, and we just have to make sure that the project finish uh, to the end and that the people see the benefits. Amazing. Uh, Kambale, in relation to what you have just said, uh, the issue of local agency and local leadership in these projects, I would like us to move the conversation on and focus a little bit upon upon one area that has been proven very controversial uh, throughout Africa, and that is um, the uh, DRC-China relationship in regards to the issue of mining. Now, we know that the majority of non-African countries and powers that come to Africa to do business are primarily driven by their desire to mine African natural resources. This is true in South Africa, in Zambia, and of course in the DRC, one of Africa's largest and wealthiest country in terms of 
natural resources. So um, just to inform our listeners, one thing to keep in mind is that the DRC is the world's largest producer of cobalt. So about two-thirds of the world's cobalt comes from the DRC. And without cobalt, you can't have modern high-tech devices. And you also can't build electric vehicle batteries. So I'd like to read a, a quote uh, to you from a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. This is a, a, a government-linked um, or adjacent think tank in the United States. Uh, this is from a gentleman called, um, or a person called Aubrey Hurubi. And um, he told the U.S. Foreign Relations Committee on Africa the following. He said, to move these supply chains, that is from the DSC and Cobalt, away from China and towards the United States and European Union, we need to create a triangle value chain that incorporates African value addition to these vital natural resources. This is interesting. So there is an obvious statement that it is in the strategic national economic political interests of the United States to cut China out of the vital um, mineral resource supply chain from the DRC. And we've heard a lot about the impact of Chinese mining in the DRC and the Western mainstream media over the last, I'd say, year or two. What is the real impact of Chinese mining investment in the DRC? And before you jump in, especially in relation to last year, there was a really crazy viral documentary. I think it was called End China's Slave Trade in the Congo, End China's Slave Trade in Africa, where it seems like the documentarian was framing Chinese mining as as a form of slavery, a form of servitude that was done by not only you know Chinese companies, but it was the explicit aim of China as a country to do so in the DRC. So uh, I'd love to get your comments on that as well. For the first question, um, it's important to frame the U.S. position, though China is the term that they're using now, that the U.S. is actually fighting to dominate the world. You know, today is China that's being mentioned, and if it wasn't China, it would be another country. Um, the U.S. has always seen the Congo as its backyard uh, for getting access to mineral resources. Uh, one of the reasons um, why Patrice Lumoire was assassinated is because that he showed that he wanted to make sure that Congo's mineral resources are benefit the Congolese people first. And within weeks, he was deposed. Within months, he was assassinated. Um, and Dwight Eisenhower, um, in many of the documents, showed that during that period, um, they were eyeing Congo's cobalt. And that in 1960, 1959, 1960, there were two places where you could get um, enough cobalt to build your military. It was the USSR and the DRC. Um, of course, Patrice Lumar was assassinated at the time. So presently, China is engaged in the Congo. Um, if China is not engaged in the Congo, other countries will be, why are they engaged in the Congo? Congo is a land that's endowed with mineral resources that's needed for modern-day technology. And China is uh, a premier nation for development of new technologies. So they do need these resources. So China is coming to the DRC and say, I would like to have cobalt. I would like to have copper. And they are purchasing uh, the land, they're purchasing the resources, and we are receiving the payment from the sale. Specifically for cobalt, that story is very uh, important to know, and I hope I can jump straight into um, the cobalt story of Tenke Fungurume, is that China... Uh, uh, through one of his company, you no know, one. We say not, when we say China, we see the Chinese government, and then there are Chinese companies. There's a Chinese company, uh, China Molybdenum. Uh, they purchased a stake in the mining in the ERC, and the stake that they purchased was eighty percent, right? And there was a mining operation in Teke Fugurume, which is in the Katanga province in the south. Uh, east of the DRC, uh, and that region borders Zambia. And the Tenke Fungurume mine had a deal where 80% went to an American company called 
Freeport McMoran and a Canadian company called London, and 20% went to uh, the DRC. That was the initial configuration. This is from the 2000s. Uh, the Congolese people, through its current um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Christopher uh, uh, Lutundula, uh, Lutundula is, uh, was in the early 2000s a member of parliament. He wrote what we call the Lutundula Commission, showing obvious contracts that existed at the time. And the companies that came up in the Lutundula Commission report was the Freemo- uh, Freeport McMoran and also the Canadian Anvil Mining and many others, right? And there was a request from the Congolese Civil Society to renegotiate this contract because it was ridiculous. 80% to London and uh, Freeport, 20% to the Congo. So we needed to renegotiate the contract. In the process of renegotiating this, this contract, the U.S. got involved. The U.S. government actually got involved. Johnny Carson, the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs in 2009, uh, 2008, I'm sorry, traveled to the DRC in a press conference in Kinshasa, stated unequivocally that the Congolese government should not renegotiate the uh, contract that Freeport has. And also additionally added other subjects around the Chinese contract uh, that's of um, the infrastructure mineral swap. So I found it very interesting that the Secretary of State um, mentioned that we did, we did not need to touch on Freeport's deal. Then Hillary Clinton. So the Secretary of State of the United States traveled to the DRC so that the DRC does not reconsider a deal with a private Canadian mining company. Canadian and American. No, Freeport and London. Canadian American. Ah, okay. There we go. Right. So Freeport and London had 80% stake in it, right? And the Congolese people are saying, we need to renegotiate this because how are you getting 80% and we are getting 20%? The Assistant Secretary of State says, no, don't touch this deal. Then Hillary Clinton comes. She also says, do not touch the Freeport deal, right? So that never the deal for Freeport was never changed, right? The Freeport London kept 80%. And Congo got 20%. And it's just died out. So for over a decade after these discussions, I'm surprised to hear that for whatever reason, um, some call mismanagement within Freeport, uh, they had a huge debt, right? So they were losing money even in the stock market that they had to start selling their assets. And the issue that they had was not in DRC. Uh, It was actually mining operation of Freeport in Latin America that they were losing money. So they needed the cash. So they go to the international market and presented that we have a stake in the mine in DRC with our Canadian partner, and the stake is 80%. Who would like to buy this 80%? China Molebenum said we will buy it. So they bought it legally. They bought it transparently. That's how we know that they actually purchased it. And they purchased the stake that Freeport McMoran had and Luden had. And now Freeport have, has cash, resolved its financial issues, and moved uh, through its life. China Monobenon is one of the uh, it's a smelter. You know, they also provide cobalt uh, to com- electronic companies and you know, the Teslas of the world and so on, who need cobalt. So they started the operation. They're ramping up. This was a $2 billion deal right, to purchase the mine tank of grooming. During COVID, surprisingly, we started hearing the Congolese government asking to renegotiate the same contract. You know, it came first from uh, the ministries saying that they are reviewing our Chinese contract. Then the Congolese president himself and it was happening at the height of the U.S.-China as a crisis, right, for U.S. dominance. And didn't the Congolese president Chisikedi? He'd recently visited the U.S. I think he visited the U.S. in October, and then shortly after, we hear he's reviewing all these deals. He did. It was a bit much earlier. His first visit to the U.S. was in 2019. 
And the first place, of course, he went was uh, the IMF or World Bank. He also met with uh, mining companies. He met with State Department officials at the time. He, he also had a meeting with Pompeo. But in all the meetings he had, uh, indications that we have is that the U.S. was providing information to them that they needed to review. So the U.S. became an advocate for Congo, surprisingly, <laughs> when they were not an advocate for Congo, when their American company was screwing the Congolese. Right? So the question was uh, that uh, the, the problem that the Congolese government was putting forward is that we need to renegotiate the 80%. In principle, it makes sense because when someone today says, how come a foreign company has 80% and the Congolese get 20%? Any logical person would say, of course, this is a ridiculous contract, but you should renegotiate that and should get the fair share. But people forget China did not purchase the stake exploding the Congolese people. They made a purchase of a stake that existed from the American company. So they did not come to the Congo and say, we are going to screw the Congolese. They say, well, this company is going down. They sold the stake and they purchased it. But the media is able to skew actually what unfolded and is presenting it. So when someone read the newspaper today, say China has, uh, China Molybdenum has uh, 80% stake. They have no idea that they inherited a problem that they have to now resolve. Because the ongoing discussion is happening. But whenever I saw that, my instinct told me that I strongly believe the United States is going to steal Thank you for guru me back. You know, and I was just saying it just in passing, you know, because it did not make sense. The US is saying that the Congolese government should look into its contract to be able to generate revenue so that they can attend to uh, his financial obligations of paying debt and so on and building the country. So you will hear those things and say, wait a minute, the U.S. really loves the Congo. <laughs> but fast forward to today, right? Actually, this month that, that's finishing where we had the visit of the U.S. Secretary of State and based on some of the meetings I had while I was here, you, it's so surprising that the U.S. Secretary of State, in a meeting with the Prime Minister of the Congo, made a comment that the U.S. is interested in getting back into cobalt in the U.S.C. Oh, wow. Oh, how convenient. And the moment I heard that sentence, it became very clear to me that Freeport McMoran is working to come back in the U.S.C. How will they come back? If, in fact, the process of re renegotiating the contract does not um, hold in a way where China Molybdenum is okay with it, because, you know, think about it, they spent $2 billion to buy 80%. And what the Congolese government is saying is that, well, we need to renegotiate it to a different percentage. And if the company feels that they are losing money to the investment and that the Congolese government continue to have this uh, gun hole position, of um, a, of going after Chinese investment in the RC, they will take the mine away from it uh, from the Chinese and put it in auction. Interesting. Why am I saying they'll put it in auction? Because right now the Congolese government has put twenty seven oil blocks and three uh, methane gas uh, blocks in auction that they are selling it to the highest bidder. And if they do so, Freeport will get the money back. But I'm sharing all of this. I mean, it's a long-winded explanation of what has unfolded with Congo's cobalt because this is the largest cobalt reserve, you know, one of the largest, you know, some say first or others say second, uh, in the world that was controlled by an American company, sold to the Chinese by the Americans, and presented in the media today as Chinese exploiting the Congolese people. When in fact, they were not. They just purchased a stake, inherited a problem, and now are trying to figure out how to resolve this contradiction that the stake they actually purchased was a trap from an American mining company called Freeport McMoran. I mean, just in that one example, 
you see the different layers at play that we, as you said, don't get to see in mainstream media and mainstream news or even in local news in our different countries, which are largely following a, and towing a Western line. So, I mean, you've clearly explained some of the contradictions and actually who are the actors benefiting in these different maneuvers. But I wanted to kind of end off with a, a question around African agency. Uh, I actually, uh, Amadeus, I actually know Kambale pretty well. We've worked in different moments and iterations uh, with social justice movements, trade unions, and around education and pan-Africanism. And one of the, the moments, the last time actually we saw him was in November 2021, we were both attending the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, which is a platform, a bilateral platform for African leaders to basically uh you know, propose different development agendas, common agendas, shared agendas with Chinese um, actors across, whether it's from health to infrastructure, to education, um, to digital projects, various things came up in November. And what I remember, we were just talking anecdotally, but I think it features into this question of agency is we were trying to meet with the different delegates coming from the different countries. And in the ministerial delegation of the DRC, uh, we saw a lot of very elderly people, which isn't representative of the average age, which is, I think, below 24, 20, must be closer to 20 in the Congo. As We are the youngest continent yes. across the board. But in the Congo itself, they must be even younger. I don't think they're, the average age is 24, but below the age of 24. And as well as we, there were one or two delegates who didn't seem to be officially working in the foreign ministry itself. Um, so my question for you as we try to end off is, with these kinds of platforms, what do you see as the future paths towards development that will benefit Africans um, within the China-Africa you know, border relationship, as well as specifically places like Fukuk? We have a challenge on our African country. We have many challenges, right? Right now, Africa, and particularly the Congo, we need roads. We need hospitals. We need universities. We need infrastructure. We need to raise the, uh, condi the conditions of living of our people. To do so, we need money. We need capital, right? So to have the money, you have to be able to create something with the resources that you have so that you can develop. Congo is a country that's very cash-trapped, very dependent on the World Bank and IMF. China's engagement on the African continent from the early 2000s to present, especially even with the Chinese deal in Congo, the $9 billion deal that came around in the early 2000s and now is $6 billion for infrastructure, was the best deal Congo can have. The deal was that China will get access to our resources. In exchange, it will build infrastructure and have a joint project with the Congo where, as we sell the mineral from the project, it pays for the debt that we have, and we continue to build the infrastructure. That's how it was uh, structured. That in the end of the deal, right, Congo will have no debt. You see, you're talking about Congo has a $2 billion debt. It's because China is being put in a framework, pushed into the international framework of the uh, fr uh, World Free Trade Agreement, um, also for in the framework of the World Bank, to make sure that Africans continue to become dependent. We are not getting this infrastructure and mineral deal as before, right? So that's where we are in the Congo, that we, we need to change the conditions of our people. We need to build this infrastructure. We need to work with someone who will understand our conditions and make sure that as we make deals, we are not indebted. Now we're finding ourselves that the people who are making decisions for us, the African people, the young people of the African continent, that... They are uh, bureaucrats. They're not technocrats. Uh, that's the compradors. That's the elite of our country. And what they are seeking is to stay in power. And many of the, uh, the local elites did not get into power because of China. 
I also look at the DRC. In the DRC, we had an election in 2018. The winner of the election was declared the loser, and the current president of the Congo, supported by the United States, was declared the winner of the election. So while I may look at the challenges of implementing Chinese projects, I'll say, about look at the Congolese politicians. Why are they sending these old men, old men, to meetings discussing the future of the country? And some of them are sleeping in the meetings. Some of them are not even paying attention about what is being discussed. <laughs> And they have no idea I'm also in the room. I'm a Congolese. I'm looking at the delegation. That's a DRC delegation. Do they represent the masses? No. Right? So in order for us to be able to transform the African continent to rise up to the call of our generation, we must deal with our local compradors. Because China needs Africa's resources. Africa needs to be uh, developed. We are meeting one another to create those changes. Do you see that? How Im- impactful? I don't know how many people have seen the picture of the bridge between Senegal and Gambia. And they've called the Mandela Bridge. You know, I wish it was Winnie Madikizela Mandela, but it's called Nelson Mandela. We'll take it for what it is. That bridge connecting today Senegal and Gambia is a bridge built by the Chinese, which will allow closer connection between the two countries. And it's not just there. Like if you come to the DRC and you see how many projects that the Chinese, are, you see it. It's not anecdotal that oh, China has uh, 59 loans that are given to the DRC and have projects. No, I am seeing concrete project buildings. I have not seen the them, but it's being built. They are in the energy. Uh, they are in the uh, roads infrastructure. Uh, they are also in education. So all these things are happening at the same time. But unfortunately, who China is dealing with is our compradors. So it's, important, it's the responsibility of Africans to really understand that as we get independence in 1960 and get uh, political independence, uh, that we are now fighting for economic independence, we must fight to make sure that the leaders that are ruling our states, our nations, our countries, are coming from the people. And though I know it's difficult, right, that as we are doing this fight, we are finding ourselves with CIA assassinations, we have U.S.-imposed leaders, our Western-imposed leaders, we must rise to the occasion to elect our leaders, not just me in Congo wor- worrying about how we're going to have a new president In the DRC, I must worry about who is the president of Zambia, what is happening there. I must wonder about what's happening in Malawi, that we all are making sure that the leaders of our countries on the African continent represent the will of the people to be able to connect to the current conjuncture of China's presence on the African continent. The engagement is way different than the West. Can it be bettered? Are there issues with it? There are some issues we can easily discuss, such as there is a difference between the Chinese state and Chinese businessmen. There are those who are also exploiting people that can be dealt with uh, very easily. We know that in the Congo, the documentary you mentioned earlier of uh, Alain Foucault uh, that mentioned uh, a Chinese company exploiting the Congolese. When the list of the six companies were presented uh, to China, these companies were sanctioned by the Chinese government. I have yet seen... Which no Western government, sorry to budge in, but no Western government, as far as I know, exactly. has ever sanctioned any company or individual involved in the exploitation of the company. Exactly. So with the challenges of dealing with China, China is here. China cannot disappear. They are our partners. They've been with us in the liberation struggle. They understand that we have to go through a process. They cannot elect our leaders. They cannot impose a political system. So if they have to get the mineral resources and build infrastructure for us, we, African people, must rest to the occasion of making sure that we have the leadership. Understanding it's not as easy as me just saying it there, that we must work not uh, from a national perspective, but from a continental perspective 
That's where Pan-Africanism comes in. We've Pan-Africanism under scientific socialism of young Africans understanding that we have to solidarize and work together in our, on our continent to liberate all of us for economic independence, then we have a better chance of dealing with an equal partner who sees us as human beings, who went through the experiences that we went through, through the um, Chinese you know, revolution. Like, how can we learn from uh, the, their experience? and then change humanity together. Now, that's at least my perspective of you know, what can happen now, how can we achieve it, and how can we understand China's presence on the African continent, and how and why we must fight to have proper representation uh, in our leadership in our countries that reflects the will, the interests of the masses, rather than of the local elite and the local bourgeoisie. Thank you so much, Kambale. I think that is an excellent place for us to stop. You raising the different issues of we can't expect to have the relationships we want if we're not represented as we want to be represented, which is so core to the question of the Forum of China-Africa cooperation and where the role of Pan-Africanism from below, from the people, needs to be built by us young Africans. As well as your point about, and I, I want to just uh, share a quote from the words of the leader Patrice Lumumba, who was assassinated by the CIA in uh, 1961, if I'm not mistaken, who shared, as you've already shared, that political independence has no meaning if it is not accompanied by rapid economic and social development. And so like many con countries on the African continent, uh, we are all looking for that economic and social development that China in part is giving us a bit of space and many, cho many more choices to actually uh, achieve. So we'd like to thank you, Kambale, for joining us on The Crane, an Africa-China podcast brought to you by the Dongsheng Collective. Thank you for joining us, Kambale. Thank you. Thank I don't know how you say thank you in Lingala. Baton Domingi. Baton Domingi. Baton Domingi. Yes, you got it correct. Maton Domingi. Maton Domingi. So, Maton Domingi Kambale, we look forward to following your work. He is a researcher at the Center for Research for the Congo Kinshasa. And we hope that in future episodes, we can maybe see you again. But thank you all for the audience who has joined us. Don't forget to subscribe on whichever platform you are following us on. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, on the social media at Dongsheng News. And we will see you next time. Or we will hopefully you'll hear from us next time. Thank you. And don't forget to like and review this podcast wherever you get your podcast from it helps more people like you discover us thank you very much and see you next time